Welcome to The Epic Life with Pastor Bob Hallman. We invite you to listen to this timeless and inspirational message from God's Word. May the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen your heart today. Okay, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans. If you'll turn in uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18 uh, through the end of the chapter. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse." For though they, although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, and he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders. God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Father, I just want to come to you once more and just ask that you would help us to understand this text, Lord, and have hearts to respond. And we pray it in Jesus' name. One of the most important things that happens when someone is ill is they need a diagnosis. They need to be properly diagnosed in order to know what's wrong. I've had times in my life and our in our, the life of our family where things have been wrong physically and sometimes we haven't even been aware of exactly what's wrong. We just know that things aren't quite right. And so we go to someone that has the skill and ability to diagnose the problem. And what we have here in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 32 is God's diagnosis of man's problem. Now a lot of people in the world know they've got problems. They're, they're lonely, they're aimless, they are struggling with a sense of meaning and significance in life. They've got problems in their marriages. They've got problems with their chi children. They've got problems with their finances. They, they struggle with how they feel about themselves. And these are all symptoms of something that's wrong in mankind because God never designed us to experience that kind of a life. What God has planned and purpose for men and women is abundant life. It means fullness of life in John 10.10, 10, that we would know Him and have peace and joy not a problem-free life, but a life of significance, a life of meaning and of value. But all throughout the earth, if you talk to anyone for any length of time, they'll begin to share with you the symptoms of something that's terribly wrong in their life. And in this passage, though it's very difficult to hear some of the things that we're going to have to talk about today, God diagnoses man's problem. Now, when I go to the doctor and and uh, I'm not feeling quite right, and he diagnoses me and tells me that something's terribly wrong, I don't get upset at the doctor. 
I, I, I might be upset that I'm as sick as he says I am, but I'm appreciative that finally I know what's wrong with me because now there is a possibility of remedy. And so in this text, God tells us through Paul in no uncertain terms what our malady is. And the rest of Romans is the remedy in how we can live a full, abundant life in Jesus Christ. Without apology, Paul describes the depth of our wickedness and our depraved situation and the punishment that God will mete out to those who fail to respond to him. In this text, we know that the Bible says that we already know the truth of God, and yet we reject it. And because of that, God says we're without excuse. It also says that we already know God, but we reject him and will suffer the consequences, both in indirect ways that I'll talk about in a few moments and direct ways. It also says that we know God's decrees and his standards and his um, regulations and laws for us, and yet we violate them. And as a result, the Bible says that we deserve death. In Romans 3.23, Paul is going to tell us that all have sinned, not some of us, not most of us, but all of us have sinned against God. Isaiah 53, 6 says that we all have strayed from God's commands. Every one of us has turned to his own way. And the result of this is that God, through his law, has delivered it in such a way that every mouth, according to Romans 3, 19, may be silenced and the whole world held accountable before God. Now, Paul begins by saying that the wrath of God in verse 18 is being revealed from heaven. I think it's interesting if you back up one verse to verse 17, we already have a revelation of God. What was it? It was the revelation of a righteousness that came from God that's by faith. So God gives us the opportunity to have a right standing with him by faith in Jesus Christ. If we refuse to accept that revelation and that righteous standing, then we have a secondary revelation of God, and that revelation is his wrath. And I'll talk about that at the end, but I want to encourage you to keep in mind is that God gives us a choice. We can experience his righteousness that's a free gift by simply receiving Christ as our Savior. But if we refuse and reject that revelation, then we will experience the wrath of God, both in this life and also in the life to come. But he does give us a choice. And so Paul says that this wrath is being revealed at it means a settled, determined indignation. There's another Greek word, thumos, which has to do with a momentary, uncontrolled emotional rage, the kind of things that we do. See, God doesn't have that kind of, a, of an out-of-control rage. The word used in Greek for him is orge. It means a settled determination and hatred for sin, expressed as it's continually revealed. I think a lot of times people think that, uh, and I'm, I've been in the same boat, where I thought the wrath of God was for the by and by, you know, at the end of all things, as we studied the book of Revelation, that when all things are concluded, the wrath of God will be revealed, and, and that's true. But Paul says here that it is being revealed in the present tense. It means that in an ongoing way, even now, the wrath of God is being revealed. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But the ultimate expression of God's wrath, if you want to know what God's wrath is like, was demonstrated at the cross of Christ. And on that cross, the fullness of the indignation of God and the hatred of God for sin was meted out on his son, Jesus Christ. You see, it wasn't, the, it wasn't just the physical pain that Jesus went through that was so terrifying but it was God's wrath being poured out on his own son. The fullness of that wrath, what I deserved and what you deserved because of our evil behavior, God made possible to be taken upon Jesus Christ so that we wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. And for those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he has not appointed us to wrath, but to life and peace and joy, which is great news. That's what the good news is all about is that through Christ we can have that wrath lifted off of our shoulders. Now, Paul tells us the focus of this wrath. It's against all godlessness, which has to do with our character. Godlessness isn't necessarily atheism. Atheism, the belief that God doesn't exist. What godlessness is, is acting as though God doesn't exist. 
It means that we go in our day that we don't even think about them. That it, the Bible says that the unbeliever in Nahum 1.3 uh, doesn't even give thought to God. There's no room in his heart for God. And many of us, I'm afraid, even as believers, sometimes that happens to me where I can go through a whole day and give just a, my time in the morning with the Lord thought and then all day be so busy that I don't give God thought. Has that ever happened to you where all of a sudden you realize, whoa, I haven't thought about God all day. And he's so merciful and loving. But the unbeliever never gives thought to God. There's no room in their heart for God. And so it's acting as though God doesn't exist even though we know he does. That's godlessness. And against all wickedness, which has to do with the behavior resulting from a godless attitude. Wickedness is the expression of godlessness in our behavior. And you notice it's never the other way around. It's not wickedness and godlessness. It's always godlessness that then leads to wickedness. And so Paul says that this wrath is already now being revealed against godlessness and wickedness. Why? Well, we're told in the second part of verse 18, it's because men suppress the truth by their wickedness. And I don't think any of us have to, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that in our time and our culture, there's a suppression of the truth of Jesus Christ. The Bible is being suppressed. Prayer is suppressed. An expression of godly moral standards is being suppressed. And in this text, it says that this is the reason for God's wrath. It could also be translated... These people are constantly attempting to suppress the truth by steadfastly holding to their sin. So by living a godless life, a life where there's no room for thinking about God and, and demonstrating it in a, in a wicked lifestyle, the result is that we suppress the truth. Now, what truth are we suppressing? What about the people that don't go to church and that don't have a Bible and that don't even, they're actually, believe it or not, there's some people in our society that don't know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. They don't know any of the Old Testament stories. They know almost zero about the Bible. What about people like that? What about the pygmies in Africa? I've been asked that question many times uh, from people who say, how could God be just? Is he going to send people to hell like that? Well, he gives us a very clear answer in this text. If you look with me uh, in verse 19. He says that God has made what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. How has he made it plain? Verse 19, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So God has revealed through two avenues his nature and his glory, the qualities of who he is and what he's like. Now, in the Bible, uh, there's some theological terms I'm going to kind of throw at you. They're very simple. One is called general revelation. General revelation uh, is a theological term referring to the revelation of God in nature that, you know, especially on this island, it's hard to miss it, isn't it? You go around and you see the beauty in the ocean and the mountains and the, the swaying palm trees and the perfect climate. And you look at it and you go, this is a work of God. But that's nothing compared to, you know, looking at yourself, your hands and your, your body and looking at other people and realizing how incredibly complex we are. We are just scratching the surface scientifically and biologically of, of how we operate. We don't even get it, really. We think we know a lot, but in reality, we know almost nothing about how we work and how fascinatingly complex we are. And so as we look at these things, the Bible says that this is a part of God's revelation of himself to man. In Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, the Bible talks about this general revelation. I'm just going to read a few verses to you. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. They're talking to us if we're listening. Night after night, they display knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of God and what he's like and his creative power and abilities. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. That means even with the pygmies in Africa, they see the same revelation in the stars and the sky and the sun and the moon and the heavens and the universe that you see. Their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So God says we already know. We may not have 
uh, for someone that doesn't have the word of God and has never had someone come and deliver the gospel to them. They may not have the details, but they know who God is. They know that they aren't God, and he is, and there's someone beyond them. And they worship him if they choose to. But God has also given us special revelation. Special revelation is the uh, revelation of God himself, primarily through the prophets and the teaching of Scripture and the Word of God, and finally in Jesus Christ. These are, are introductions of God's communicated heart and desire for the world in a way that we can comprehend so that we can follow him. And we have that. And one of the things that, uh, that I encourage you on and regularly, and I, I'm not ashamed to do it again because I love to encourage you, is that be men and women who regularly study the word, who know it, who love it, because it's a revelation of God. I mean, to think that we have in our hands access to the heart of God and to know his attributes and his characteristics is beyond belief. And yet, here it is for us to read and study, to know who he, who he is and what he's like. And the interesting thing is in the second part of, of uh, Psalm 19, we have a, a, a listing of his divine nature in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. We're told about the law of the Lord, but the law of the Lord is a reflection of his nature and character. Listen to some of the attributes of God. He's perfect. He's trustworthy. He's right in everything. He's radiant. He's pure. He's altogether righteous. He's more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. That's what Jesus is like. That's what the Lord is like. And so God, through a, a divine revelation of himself, has told us who he is and what he is like. And so because of that, the Bible says that men are without excuse when they say, oh, we didn't know. We don't know who God is. We didn't know he was really God. We thought he was just a good teacher or a good man or a prophet. But God has clearly distinguished himself as unique in all of creation. There is no leader, no guru, no prophet, no man or woman that even comes close to comparing with God Almighty or his son, Jesus Christ. It's interesting. There's a, most of you are familiar with Helen Keller. Some of you are young enough that... Uh, you may not even know who Helen Keller is, which is a little frightening to realize I may know something that some of you don't because I'm getting older. But um, Helen Keller was uh, deaf and mute and blind. She was given up into the, into the system years and years ago. She's dead, long dead now. But uh, she, back then, they had no real recourse for someone like that, and they just put them in a home and gave up on them and kind of threw the key away. Well, a woman named Ann Sullivan had a heart for Helen Keller and began to teach her, uh, and began to, to train her how to communicate and how to, how to be able to share and, and open her life. And lo and behold, this woman was incredibly intelligent, and people thought she was just an idiot because she couldn't communicate. Far from the truth. Anne made such progress with, progress with her, and Anne Sullivan was a believer, and she wanted to communicate to Helen the beauty and the wonder of who God was. And remember, never having read the Bible, never having heard of who God was, never knowing anything about him, as Anne was communicating who this wonderful God and Savior was, Helen said to her, I already know him. I just didn't know his name. God has revealed in us and shown us his heart. He has made it known to us in Ecclesiastes 3.11, the scripture says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. There's something in us that knows that there's a God and a creator. And because of that, we are all without excuse if we don't respond to God. He has made it plain to us through his created order and through his revealed word. Now, in spite of that, Man will reject God, and because of that, God's wrath will come on man for that rejection. We find in verse 21 several reasons for that rejection. He says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. There are two things. They refused to give God glory. Glory basically is just honor that's due his name. And they refused to give him thanks. They refused to acknowledge that, as the Bible says in James 1.17, that every good and perfect gift is down to the Father in heaven. 
The Bible also says in the book of Acts that, that God sends the rain on the believers and unbelievers alike so the crops can grow. But people refuse to acknowledge that God even exists. They will not glorify Him as God, nor will they give thanks to Him. And right now we are in a state in our culture, in our country, and growingly in the world where we will not glorify God, nor will we give thanks to Him. It's gotten so bad that we can't sing Christmas carols that mention Jesus in our schools anymore. We can't pray in public places. Do you know that in the, in the White House, in the rotunda, you are not allowed to pray in, in that uh, facility? And in many government buildings, you are not allowed to hold prayer gatherings anymore. We can't read the Bible in our schools. We can't post the Ten Commandments. Nobody even wants to admit that there is a God. Uh, and if they do, they don't glorify Him or give thanks to Him. And the Bible tells us that there's a price to pay for that kind of rejection of God. And we're told in verse 21 in the second half what it is. The first thing is that their thinking became futile. Thinking becoming futile. In Ephesians, we're told that by Paul, chapter 4, that we are not to live like the unbelievers who live in the futility of their thinking. Now listen to what it says, why they are futile in their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and they're separated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them. How did that ignorance come about? It says because it's the hardening of their hearts. They would not submit to God. They would not allow themselves to glorify God or to thank Him or acknowledge Him. And God actually allowed the skewed and perverted thinking of man. And I was in the same boat. And all of us were at one time too before we came to know Christ. We didn't get it. And we couldn't figure it out. And it didn't make any sense to us. We were lost in futile thinking because of the hardness of our hearts. He also goes on to say that our foolish hearts were darkened. People think they can actually be free from rejecting God. But the Bible says that when we reject Him, our hearts are actually darkened and become blacker. Verse 22 says that we claim to be wise, but we became fools. It doesn't mean like imbeciles. It just means people who don't know how to live wisely. That we don't know how to live wisely. And don't we have evidence of that all around us? I mean, look at your friends and neighbors and family and maybe sometimes in our own lives where we make bad choices and, and our foolish hearts are darkened and we think we're wise. We think we're doing what's good for us but we keep getting bitten by the consequences of the bad choices. And this is what happens to people who reject God. It goes on and says in verse 23 that we exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. And he goes on to list the, the man and the animals and the birds and the reptiles. You know, more more then probably most places on this island, there are actually people that bow down to idols. I, I know that's for you on the mainland. That seems a little bizarre, but we do over here. Not we, but as a culture, we do. We have all kinds of gods here. We've got New Age gods. We've got Hindu gods. We've got Hawaiian gods. And people still continue to worship these gods and bow down. But for most people, that's not our problem when we talk about the worship of man. The worship of man for our culture is the worship of self. It's the worship of, of who we are and what we want to be and how great we are and how wise we are. We want to elevate ourselves to the, to the state of God. And we actually have friends that um, I, I was really blown away when I first got here. And I had some friends who were um, New Agers and, and Hindu. And uh, they really believe uh, I, in, his, in his room, uh, he had this poster that says, I am God. And he had all of these positive confessions about his nature and his attributes, all God-like qualities. And, and he really believed that he was God and becoming a, a, a God. And I, I, I have to admit, I laughed when I saw it because I thought it was a joke. But he was dead serious. And so there are people that actually elevate themselves to that position. But there's some other ways that the Bible says that man commits adult or, or idolatry in, uh, in their life by the worship of man. And I'll, I want to read you a quote. Uh, if I can find it here, where am I? I'm a little lost. Um, Colossians 3, verse 5. The Bible says that we are to put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Listen to what the list is. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Because these things are idolatry. These are all things that we're, we're trying to gratify ourselves. And in that sense, we're lifting ourselves up above God. 
And by doing so, we become those who have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And of course, we know that these behaviors and attitudes lead to death. Now, we but came to Christ, we, we were trying to strive for these things because we thought these things brought significance and meaning and purpose and pleasure. And the really kind of pathetic thing is that man thinks that left to ourselves, we are evolving and growing and becoming greater and more godlike, when in reality, left to ourselves, the trend is downward. And we find that trend recorded for us here in this passage. Actually exchange worshiping God for worshiping ourselves. It's ridiculous. I know myself well enough to know that I should not be worshiping me. And maybe you know yourself well enough, and maybe you know me well enough not to worship me or to worship each other. But we have a tendency inbred in us through the fallen nature to want to worship ourselves. We take extremely good care of ourselves. What was watching out for ourselves and making sure everything's right for us? We've got all kinds of room in our head for ourselves, but no room for God. And the Bible calls that idolatry. But it gets worse because then we, we give that up because we realize that doesn't meet our needs. So we start worshiping animals, cows, and rats. And then it goes to birds, and then it goes to re reptiles and snakes. They're, Actually, the, the Egyptians had gotten so degraded in their thinking that they actually worshipped what they call a scarab beetle. That's a nice term. The, the ugly term, it's a dung beetle. They actually worship this beetle that spends its day digging around in dung. And that's the, the place that man was reduced to, exchanging the worship of God Almighty who has created all of this and loves us and cares about us and has revealed his righteous standing that we can have through Jesus Christ so that we can be forgiven of our sins and instead of that, we choose to worship a little beetle who's digging around in dung. It's sad. Probably one of the clearest examples of this, and it's only one example, but the Hindus. They have 330 million gods that they worship. Most of those gods they consider to be deities, but they also worship the other ones and, and follow them and watch out for them for a, sing, a singular reason, because it might be their anti or their uncle, or their father, or their mother, or someone else who is in the reincarnated cycle of life. And so they never want to kill anything. There are actually people, uh, even in, in Egyptian culture, who worship flies. One of the reasons why God sent flies as a judgment, the ten plagues of Egypt, the flies and gnats, because they worshiped all of these creatures and more. And of course, Deuteronomy chapter 4 forbids all of this type of worship. Now, something quite uh, startling happens in verse 24. After God revealing himself and making himself known in the plainest of ways, man rejecting repeatedly God's forays and, and uh, efforts at a relationship with him, finally says, if you are so determined to follow these other gods, if you are so determined to reject me and to not glorify me and give me proper thanks and honor, then I am going to give you over to what you really want. I'm not going to stand in the way anymore. Up until now, I've been restraining you. I've been restraining the culture, but now I am going to give you over to those things that you seem to be so determined to experience. C.S. Lewis has said this, a great uh, scholar and theologian, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. Either we are those who surrender ourselves to the will of God or God will surrender us to our own will and God forbid. And is there not a person here who can raise your hand and say, when I was surrendered to my will, I suffered for it. When I departed from Christ and went my own way. And I certainly know I can say that. And so God gives people over. Now, how does he actually give people over? I mean, what is it, what, how does he do it? Well, I think there are two ways. The first way that I want to mention is indirectly. He gives people over indirectly through cause and effect, through the consequences of our own sin. Now, a lot of times, people don't even recognize that as being from God, but who developed cause and effect? Who was the one that put the, the order of life in such a way that if you sow a certain type of seed that you would reap a certain type of crop? And there are many of us, and myself included when I was younger, who sowed bad seed in my life, and I reaped a bad crop. And some of that crop I still am burdened by. God has forgiven me, but I still have, you know, the knowledge that I sowed a bad crop. And some of you are the same way. 
We see it in a variety of areas. If you are financially irresponsible or if you are a thief or a criminal of some sort, there is a natural consequence is that eventually you will be caught and you will have to pay a price. That is the wrath of God. There are some who have been very prolific in their sexual immorality and have experienced uh, STDs. This is a natural, indirect consequence of God, God giving us over to our desires, but it's an experiencing of the wrath of God, a natural punishment, a natural consequence for our choices, and certainly there are many others. But sin itself, it degrades man and it strips us of our dignity. It takes away our peace of mind and ruins a clear conscience. It destroys personal relationships and marriages and families and cities and nations. And it leads to loneliness and frustration and meaninglessness and despair. These are natural consequences for sin. We don't often recognize it as being the wrath of God, but most certainly it is. It's God's way of saying something's wrong. There's a malady in our lives, and God wants to give us the remedy. But when he does this in such a gracious way, he doesn't just scorch us on the spot. And sometimes if you felt like you wish that would happen sometimes to people that you don't like, you know, where you, there's something, some form of wickedness that's just so terrible, you wish that God would just strike that person dead and they seem to be getting away with it. Have you ever had that happen in your life? But God's way is to incrementally turn the heat up. Why? Because he wants to give us an opportunity to respond. God is so patient and so gracious, but according to Nahum, he will not leave the guilty unpunished. And so oftentimes we look at the consequences of life and we just don't even get it, that God is involved in these consequences, that God is trying to get our attention. And I want to encourage you, there may be some of you here today that are, are burdened and suffering under consequences of choices, and you are just working hard to you know, get out of it. You are finagling and conniving and scheming and and you're just trying your best to hold on by your fingernails to make it through this crisis. And the thing I want to tell you is that God is showing you the malady of your life. And he's saying, stop scheming. Stop trying to work this out yourself. Come to me and repent and come clean and I will deliver you. And I will help you. And I will see you through this. Now there's a second way that that God reveals his wrath and gives people over, and that's directly, by actually punishing men and women for their sins with clear acts of judgment. We have many examples of this in Scripture. Uh, the first one was Adam and Eve. What happened to them? They sinned against God. God directly at that moment, not through just natural consequences, but he said, from now on, death will be a part of humanity. And so God directly judged. We have the direct judgment of God in the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Egyptians uh, as they were pursuing Israel. We have the direct judgment of God with Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. And we have repeated promises of God's future judgment that will be extremely direct. But for most part, most of us are, are experiencing and most unbelievers are experiencing the malady of God's indirect judgment, cause and effect. But they're not recognizing it as, they're just saying, oh, bad thing happened because I did. But they're not recognizing that God is the one that instituted that for their remedy to help them to see, to come to the great physician who has the diagnosis and has the remedy at the same time. Now in verse 24, we're told what God actually gives us over to, to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. It's a, a term that means uncleanness or a, a rotten, decaying condition. But as a moral term, it's used for sexual impurity, sexual immorality, and, and that would be uh, intercourse outside of monogamous marriage. Any relationship outside of monogamous marriage, uh, sexually speaking, is uh, sexual impurity. And the Bible actually goes on to say that when we do that, we're actually degrading one another. That we're actually diminishing the quality and the image-bearing nature of our lives before God when we commit sexual immorality. And I know that sexual immorality is rampant in our culture. We've got a divorce rate that's pushing 75% now in our culture. Just astonishing. Hard to even imagine. And men committing adultery against their wives and wives committing adultery against their husbands and unmarried people uh, committing sex of, uh, sexual acts of immorality and damaging themselves and degrading themselves. And for those of us that have been involved in that kind of a lifestyle, 
We know what it's like. It does. It takes you down. It makes you discouraged. It, it strips you of dignity and a sense of well-being and a, and a sense of a clear conscience. And so God gives people over to that because they're so determined. He doesn't want us to go that way. But if we just keep pushing and pressing, he will give us over. And then to false worships where we, we exchange God's truth for a lie, which we've already talked about. And as a result, we worship the created order of things and creation versus the creator. Isaiah 50, 11 tells us the consequence of that. And it's very clear that this is what you will receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. This is frightening. A lot of people don't like to talk about this aspect of God's nature, but it's just as much a part of his nature as his love. And he will demonstrate his wrath, both indirectly and directly. And in the end, he will demonstrate it in the fullest degree. But as I said, for those that want to escape that wrath, which... I'm raising my hand and waving, and I know many of you are too. God has provided a way through Christ where he poured out the full extent of his indignation and wrath on Christ so that you wouldn't have to experience that wrath. And that through that, you have a perfect and right standing with God. No shame that we can be free and that he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west and the deepest part of the seas. But it gets worse. In verse 26, because they did these things, to, gave themselves to sexual immorality and false worship, God gave them over to shameful lusts. And it says, even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. And in the same way, men also who uh, abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. We're talking about the homosexual lifestyle. Um, women having sexual relations with women and men having sexual relations with men. And I have to say that, as you know, in our culture, uh, this is becoming more and more predominant, and it is going to continue to become more and predominant. Uh, but it was also predominant in Paul's day when he wrote this text. In fact, actually more so than it is in our culture today. In the first century, homosexuality was commonplace. Socrates and many of the great philosophers, along with the great politicians of that day, were homosexuals. In fact, the first 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors were all homosexuals. And we are now moving more and more that direction in our own time. Now, these people were actually inflamed with lust for one another. We're not talking about somebody who's kind of like has a tendency. We're talking about people who just think about this night and day who are inflamed with lust. And we are certainly approaching that in our own culture. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of that. You remember the story where Lot was living there and three visitors came. They were angels to, to come and see if if the cry that was coming from, from uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was really true, that it was as bad as it was, and, it, and of course they discovered it was worse than they thought. And the, the angel came out and rescued Lot when these men and boys of the whole city came to, to basically rape these visitors. And the angel blinded all of them, and it says that they continued through the night looking for the door. Even though they were blinded, they experienced the direct judgment of God it's an amazing thing that God didn't strike them dead right on the spot, but he just blinded them to help them come to their senses, but they wouldn't, and they continued to seek out these visitors. Now, the Bible consistently condemns homosexuality. Leviticus 18.22. Under the Old Covenant, we are told that it's actually a, a, a crime that's punishable by death. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Now, in the New Testament, we're told that those who persist in this lifestyle will actually be excluded from the kingdom of God. Now, this is only one part of the list of these exclusion, uh, of these uh, activities that would exclude someone from heaven. So, but Paul focuses in on this because I think it's one of the more degrading uh, examples of our sinfulness and our rejection of God's created order. Now, in our culture, as you know, we've been told that homosexuality is normal and that we have uh, teachings in our school system going all the way down to now first grade, uh, in, in, inducting people and helping them understand and introducing these children into a lifestyle of acceptance of homosexuality. Uh, we've been told that there's actually a homosexual gene. Does everybody remember that six years ago when we were all informed that, lo and behold, there's actually a gene, which means that these, you know, the homosexual community, they're not responsible. It's something that God did to them, that God allowed this to happen. Well, I was, um, just happened to be looking on my um, uh, internet server and looking at CNN News. 
And uh, I wasn't even searching for anything in this regard. And lo and behold, here's an article by a columnist that says that the gay-friendly media has failed to report that the gay gene doesn't exist, and it never did. Did you know that? That it was a lie. Don Feeder, who's not even a Christian, uh, in the Boston Herald has reported that some six years later, the gene hasn't been found. And interest in the quest among scientists and activists who are frequently one and the same, I might add, has faded because the gene doesn't exist. Has anybody heard that? You see that on the nightly news, that they made a big mistake and there is no gay gene? You'll never hear it, because that would go against the agenda that the homosexual community has. And so there's an increasing activist agenda, and I'll share something with you briefly, is that I think that there's gonna come a time when it's this particular issue that will shut churches down. I think that there's gonna come a time, right now we have legislation pending for hate crime legislation, that hate crime is being pushed specifically by the gay community. Uh, it's uh, kind of clouded in a, in a, in a bigger umbrella of uh, racism and you know, religion and other things, but the, the agenda is being pushed by the gay community so that even saying the truthful facts about the gay lifestyle uh, would be considered crime. That if you uh, in any way denigrate someone uh, by speaking the truth, for instance, teaching on this passage, I believe in, in, uh, in uh, probably a time that will surprise us and how quickly it will come, will be the cause of the loss of nonprofit status for churches and the shutting down of churches. And, uh, but I will continue to teach whatever the Word of God says. I, I'm not on a hobby horse about this um, at all, but it's in our text, and so I must teach on it. Now, the Bible says that uh, the homosexual lifestyle is a sin like other sins, and it can be forgiven and from which a person can be delivered. And we find lots of evidence of this, and yet the homosexual community actually, um, there was a, another article that I didn't bring with me, but a, um, a writer uh, for a mainland paper was actually fired, though he had a stellar record up until this point, but he revealed that he was an ex-homosexual and a Christian, and uh, was writing this article as an interview, describing how people could be delivered from homosexuality, and it wasn't something that they had to live with. And uh, he was immediately fired. And now, of course, he's bringing a lawsuit uh, for that uh, uh, inappropriate dismissal. But that's the way that, uh, uh, that our culture is dealing with these issues at this point. Now, the Bible says in verse 27 that uh, people who live this type of lifestyle will receive in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Now, a lot of people dance around this text, and I, I just, I, I will not. I think that there are some terrible consequences that are, are indirect consequences of the homosexual lifestyle. And I think clearly uh, AIDS is a frightening and fatal promise that we have here in the book of Romans. People don't like to talk about that, but without question, AIDS is a homosexual uh, a disease. It's something that tried to tell us that everyone can get it, you're all at risk, if, even if you're heterosexual and monogamous, it's a lie. If you are faithful to your spouse, and if you are faithful to God's uh, clear teaching regarding sexual uh, immorality, you have absolutely nothing to fear. But if you live a lifestyle that goes outside of the borders of God's created order and you continue to violate, fail to glorify Him, fail to thank Him, fail to, uh, to live in a, in a wise way, then you will experience the indirect consequences of God's judgment. And though um, the, uh, the gay community is, is really burdened by this, uh, they continue and persist. And the latest uh, information I have is that uh, a lot of the concern that the homosexual community had years ago when AIDS first came out has now subsided, mainly because of drugs and uh, the ability to suppress um, the, uh, the ravaging effects of AIDS. And I look at this and I think, you know, uh, some people say, how could God let this happen? Well, he told us that there would be consequences to our sin and that we would receive in ourselves the due penalty for our perversions. And so this happens. Unless we become arrogant and become judgmental, uh, we have to recognize that God in his word says there are things that he hates more than this sin. A lot more than this sin. You want to know what it is? Pride. Self-righteousness. A puffed up heart. He hates. And the homosexuality may bear the consequences of sin different than other types of sin. It's no different than other sins and people can be forgiven. And we need to be reaching out to that community along with every other community that God has put us in the midst of on this island with a message of hope and of Jesus Christ because he offers life to everyone who would call on him. Now because of this in verse 28, we're told that we are given over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. 
And he lists every kind of sin that you can imagine here, but this, sin, this list is not exhaustive. It's simply representative of the virtually endless ways in which man can express his sinful rebellion against God. Now, verse 32. Man's response to God's forewarned wrath. You'd think that we would all just see the remedy and see the diagnosis and see the malady and say, oh God, forgive us and help us to walk in your way. Help us to be delivered. Help us to be free. But no, that's not what happens. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. And so we find that there is a continued practice of these sins. We're told in 1 John that no one who lives a life in Christ continues in a lifestyle of habitual sin. It's not saying that we don't stumble at times or make some bad choices because we all do and Praise the Lord that he gives us John, uh, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But the fact is, is that those who persist in sin, I don't care if they've prayed the prayer in their life, if they've said some, some sort of a, of a, you know, acceptance of Jesus. What the Bible says is that if someone is truly transformed by God and truly saved, you will see the evidence of it in their life. And they won't continue to persist in willful disobedience to God but not so the unbeliever. They will persist, and I might say even those who claim to be believers, and yet their life continually, perpetually, is a reflection of the rejection of Jesus Christ. But these people aren't satisfied with just practicing it. They actually give hearty approval to those who also participate with them. They actually encourage them and applaud the sin, their own sin that they see practiced in others. And we see this happening more and more in the field of education, and the media is dominated by this kind of teaching. People are seeking legal status for this immorality and applauding people who are, who are um, uh, following that lifestyle. And of course, as we saw uh, on television in, a, in a, just a, a shameful way just a few weeks ago, uh, Boy Scouts actually being booed down uh, for their stand for sexual purity and morality. And God says in 2 Chronicles 19, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Should that really be the mark of our world? Is that people would actually participate in sin and then approve of those who are violating God left and right? And the really amazing thing to me is that God gives these beautiful and, and patient warnings through indirect judgment and his wrath. I, I, I look at it now and, you know, I didn't recognize it either before I was a Christian. But it began to dawn on me just in my process of coming to Christ and then certainly afterwards that, God, you know, he could have just toasted us right on the spot when we sinned, but he doesn't. He lets us experience, some of us, over and over and over and over the consequences of the same sin. Why doesn't he just kill us? I don't know, except that he loves us so deeply. And you see, God has the end game in mind. He doesn't mind allowing us to go through some difficulty in this life if it means salvation for eternal life because of his deep love for you. And so if you have struggled or are struggling under the, the consequence of some repeated sin in your life, God is saying, oh, you're sick. There's a malady in your life. And you might even be a believer and be experiencing a malady in your life. And the Holy Spirit this morning, I pray, is putting his finger on it, not to you or embarrass you, but to draw you to that place of understanding what the proper diagnosis is is that it's a failure to glorify God. It's a failure to thank Him. It's, a, it's a having exchanged what God meant to be such a thing of beauty, and we've exchanged it for the, the lie of the enemy. And He wants to redeem you and, and rescue you. And so if that's the case in your life, I encourage you and repent and come back to the Lord. And it may be that some of you are here today and you've never received Christ, and you, as I'm talking, you're thinking, wow, that makes a lot of sense. We are kind of full of illness in our culture. And yeah, I've got malady in my own life. And I, I just thought it was just because that's the way life is. And the answer is that's not the way life was meant to be. God designed it so that you would have a life of peace and a clear conscience and joy and that you would have an intimate relationship with him and, and the freedom to talk to him anytime you want without guilt or shame. And God has made that possible through Jesus Christ. And so the choice is clear. Romans 1.17 First, he's revealed a righteousness that comes from him. How do we have a righteous standing with God? By putting our faith in the cross of Christ and in Jesus' sacrifice. 
where the full wrath of God has already been poured out. You see, it had to be poured out. God can't just say, oh, never mind, you're okay. But it has to be poured out. But before the end times, before the final day of judgment, he poured it out in advance on his son so that when you come to that final day, you could be free and guilt-free before him and have a righteous standing. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. But for those that fail to receive this and persist in their own way, God will give you over. God will give the unbelieving world over and you will face the righteous wrath of God against all ungodliness and wickedness. John chapter 3, verse 36 in closing summarizes really this whole teaching. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Not you might have or you can hope to have it, but has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son of God will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Both the indirect wrath and the final future wrath of the Lamb of God. And so this is a, a very powerful passage. It's very straight and to the point. It doesn't pull any punches, but God wants us to know what our malady is. And he wants you to know, if you don't know already, that he has diagnosed the problem. And not only has he diagnosed it, but he's got the remedy. And it's in his hand. And he's willing to give you that remedy free of charge. And all you have to do is come to him and say, I want the remedy. And of course, the remedy is his son, Jesus Christ. What does he ask of us? But to believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and to turn from our sin and to turn toward him and to properly glorify him and give him thanks and give him the honor and respect that is due him. And what will happen is that God will begin to lift you and give your life purpose and meaning that you never even imagined possible because of his deep, deep love for you. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, when we were still sick, when we were still full of mad malady, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. And I would encourage you this morning to turn your heart toward the Lord, to give yourself more fully to Him than you ever have before, and to realize that we have a message of hope to a sin-sick world. You've got friends and family all around you who are burdened by the indirect wrath of God and they need help, and they need your direction, and they need your prayer, because God has placed you strategically in their lives to show them the way, to describe the diagnosis, and to share with them the remedy of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. God, we honor you and we praise you. God, and it's a fearful thing to realize, God, your wrath, but it's true. And Lord, we're experiencing your wrath. It's being revealed even today. And Lord, we just thank you that it's not your direct wrath, but you've given us an opportunity through the increasing pressure of cause and effect in our life to turn away from our sin and turn toward you. And Lord, I pray that whatever you're working in my heart and in the hearts of these men and women and young people here today, that you would have your full effect and the full course of your purposes would be accomplished, that we might turn back to you, Lord, and surrender ourselves to you and admit that we're not nearly as wise as we think we are, but God, you are the source of all wisdom and truth. And so God, we give you glory today, and we say thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your son. And thank you, God, that you have removed from us the punishment that we so clearly deserved and have given us freedom in Christ, a righteousness that's from God by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. The Epic Life is a listener-supported ministry designed to encourage and equip believers to go big for God by loving Him, loving others, and making disciples. You can visit our website at theepiclife.org. God bless you.